Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So my title is uh, Improved Testing of Multi-Threaded Programs with Dynamic Symbolic Execution. So this is a, a direct continuation of what uh, Tom talked about this, this morning, but uh, instead of talking too much about the Dynamic Symbolic Execution and the SMT solver side of things, I'm going to talk about uh, multi-threaded programs and uh, how partial order reductions can be used in multi-threaded programs to make testing for them more efficient. This is joint work with uh, two of my PhD students, uh, Kari Kähkönen, Kari is there in the back row, so, and uh, Olli Saarikivi, Olli is next to him, so, so I'm using uh, most, uh, most of the pictures in here are from Kari's PhD thesis, uh, or a draft of it, and uh, some of the slides are made by Olli, so those guys in the back row are the guys who did the real work, uh, and I have the pleasure to uh, talk about it and, uh, and to uh, um, discuss this in, in a kind of broader context. Also, if there are bugs on slides, they are mine, not, not the guys. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, what uh, kinds of validation methods are there for concurrent systems? So, so there are many system validation methods. I'm uh, uh, um, here talking about automatic test generation using white box testing. Uh, we have model-based approaches, we'll hear more uh, later in this uh, summer school about model-based testing where we automatically generate test cases uh, for an implementation from a model of a system. We have model checking uh, where we explore a model of a system exhaustively uh, and uh, we have also many other techniques like theorem proving, uh, trying to prove programs correct uh, then uh, using abstraction, we can sometimes tackle bigger problems, etc. But here we're talking about source code analysis, so white box testing. And uh, I'm going to talk about automated test generation, especially for multi-threaded programs. Uh, but there are many other approaches as well, static analysis tools, software model checking, theorem proving for source code, etc., etc. So I'm only going to talk about the testing side of things. Though we are slowly moving into, let's say, to the uh, bo border between model checking and testing. So model-based versus source code-based approaches. So model-based approaches such as model-based testing uh, require building the verification model. And this can uh, sometimes uh, be uh, um, hard. Well, in hardware designs, uh, the model is your design usually. So, so what gets model checked is usually the VHDL or Verilog source code. Uh, and um, we basically have the model that gets model checked uh, and uh, the same model from which you build the actual designs you also put into your model checking tools. Uh, this is usually not so for software. Uh, why is it the case? Well, because software is just more complex. It is uh, a much more challenging uh, scenario to, uh, to uh, test software. And uh, quite often a significant time effort is needed to build the system models. Um, and uh, making the cost benefit argument is not easy for non-safety critical software. Um, so I've worked a bit with, uh, for example, model checking safety critical systems. And there you can uh, uh, kind of afford to put a lot of effort on the model building side. Uh, but this is not always the case for software. Um, one of the nice things about source code analysis tools is uh, that they make model building cheap. So, so basically we're building the models as we go. Uh, so each time we execute a line of code, we notice that, oh, there's uh, this line of code in the program and it does the following. And uh, the tools build the models from source code as they go. Uh, and um, they kind of uh, build the model lazily in the way that, okay, source code that uh, never gets uh, executed never ends up in the model. And this is uh, quite useful so that you don't have a huge model to start with. Uh, you can start with a small model and, and, and build as you go. Okay. So the automated testing problem. So uh, we want to test uh, for local state reachability here. So local state reachability, what that means? Well, we want to check whether a particular line of the program is reachable or not. And we want to do this for multi-threaded programs. Uh, with this, you can check for assertion violations. So if you have an assertion in your program 
That assertion talks about the local variables of the program, and that assertion will fire if and only if uh, that line of code is basically executable. Uh, we can uh, look for uncaught exceptions, etc. So our tools will uh, use a subject of Java as, as the input language. Uh, we also have some uh, tooling available for C, uh, but not all of the things that I'm going to talk about today are, are available for the C language. Um, the main challenge in here is going to be what's called the path explosion problem. So this is similar to the, uh, mo uh, to the state explosion problem, but because we're working with tools that do not have state, so they're stateless uh, uh, state space exploration tools, uh, the path explosion problem is actually even more severe uh, than the uh, state explosion problem. And therefore, if you work with multi-threaded programs, actually, um, it is much more crucial that you use uh, the best partial order reduction and other techniques to try to combat the state explosion because it is a much more difficult problem than the uh, state space explosion when you don't have state. So one popular testing approach is dynamic symbolic execution that Tom talked about. Uh, I'll have a very quick recap about that. And then uh, you can in include also so-called partial order reduction techniques. So these are techniques for multi-threaded programs that try to uh, minimize the number of test cases you need to test and still be able to figure out uh, whether a particular line of code is, is still reachable or not. And the new approach that I'm going to talk about here is actually uh, something we published two years ago in ASE 2012. Uh, so this is actually uh, employing dynamic symbolic execution methods with a new technique called, uh, well, the technique is old, but uh, this combination is new with a technique called unfoldings. But I'll come back to that a bit later. Okay, so um, here's my recap of the dynamic symbolic execution. Sorry, I'll take a sip. So let's consider this program in here. So uh, we have a program, uh, and this is now a single-thread program, so no multi-threading uh, is there yet. So let's assume that uh, this is the program's control flow graph, and there's a path through it, let's say this. There's another path through here, then it can loop back, etc. And let's say that the uh, program is, uh, is such that, okay, first it takes an input, then it does some computation on the input, then uh, let's say this is an if then else statement where uh, the inputted variable is, uh, is compared against the constant and depending on that either one of the branches is taken or the other branch. Now uh, in this dynamic symbolic execution usually we start with a random execution through the program. Uh, the program is executed concretely so, so we run the program through using random input values. So instead of having this input in here, we call basically the random routine to get us a random 32-bit integer. Um, then that takes us uh, through a program flow. Uh, and um, what, what our tools do is they also add instrumentation to the program. So for each line of the program, uh, we add another line which says, OK, this line uh, is going to be executed it's going to generate uh, a new input value. Please record this in, in a symbolic uh, path constraint uh, like Tom was using uh, with his Python tools. Uh, and then, OK, we're executing this line, and now you have to change the symbolic constraint to also have uh, x equals x plus 5, etc. and then until we hit an if then else branch. And then once we've done that, then if we've uh, gone through the program and done this uh, if branch and then we want to go to the else branch, uh, we can uh, generate uh, a path constraint like this. So, okay, so let's see uh, how this goes. So suppose uh, we have this uh, now symbolic uh, kind of tree um, and, and we generated uh, these constraints. The constraint going this way is that the input plus 5 is greater than 10. So this is going to the if branch. Uh, this branch over there is that input plus 5 is less than or equal to 10. So this is going to this branch. Now, if we want to uh, go either this way or that way, we can use an SMT solver to solve these constraints. 
and get the input values we need uh, to, to drive that through. So a conjunction of symbolic constraints along an execution path is called a path constraint. And we collect these using the, the uh, what's this called, uh, the uh, instrumentation of the program, which instrumentation basically records every line of the program as it gets executed and records that, okay, what are the data modifications that get done and what are the uh, if statements that are encountered and which way did we go. And now we can use uh, SAT modular theory solvers to um, obtain uh, concrete test inputs uh, and uh, get these to uh, get the program into unexplored execution paths. So suppose we have uh, such a program, uh, uh, let's say, program, uh, okay, I'll, let me use the end one, uh, uh, kind of uh, this constraint, path constraint which says that, okay, input plus five must be greater than 10. And then uh, we obtain another input to the program uh, such that uh, the multiplication of these two must be 50 to get us, uh, let's say, along, along this path C4, C1, C4. Then we can solve this and SMT solvers are very good these days. And you can get that, okay, in order to get down this path, you need to feed those values. So the nice part about dynamic symbolic execution is that because it uses SMT solvers uh, to solve these branches, uh, each time you um, test through the program, you will actually explore a different execution path. So if you would do random testing, just uh, flipping random numbers to input one and two, the probability that you would hit a new path is pretty low. So, so the nice part about this is that, okay, if the control flow path has three paths through this and the SMT solver is able to solve them, then you have three test cases. And those have, will have covered all, all of the reachable uh, states in your program. And now, uh, why this works now and didn't work 10 years ago is basically that the SMT solvers have improved so much. So we can have bit precise reasoning on 32-bit integers with very complex data manipulations going on, and they will not uh, choke on, on the constraints we feed them. Okay, so what about multi-threaded programs? So we need to be able to uh, reconstruct scheduling scenarios. Um, uh, so, so one of the problems in testing multi-threaded programs, if you just test them on your own, is that, okay, you have this problem that, uh, let's say you have a test case uh, and you run it once and the program does a particular interleaving, let's say it runs thread fir one first and then thread two, and then you run the same test case again, then the program might actually do another interleaving where it does a thread two and then thread one, and the bug you would have found using the first interleaving has gone away, right? Because of just the non-deterministic interleaving. So in here, we have to, of course, avoid this. So we must have uh, uh, repeatable uh, test cases, also for uh, multi-threaded programs. So what we do is, is a kind of classical thing. So we take full control of the scheduler. Uh, so who gets to run first is fully under our control. So we run all the program, all the threads, until they hit something that is globally visible, like, a, a, let's say, a read of a global variable, write of a global variable, uh, or a lock. And uh, this is uh, similar to what was uh, done already, I don't know, early 90s by, uh, by Patrice Godefroy in, in, in the very soft tool. Uh, that did testing of C++ programs. Um, and um, then what we have here is, okay, suppose we go down this branch, and now uh, all the threads have been blocked. So let's say thread one is trying to read thread a global variable, thread two is trying to write a global variable, and thread three is trying to, let's say, grab a lock. Then we have a scheduling decision, and we have to run one of the threads forward. And now, because we uh, are able to control the scheduling, we can reproduce our test cases. So a test case is not only the set of inputs we, we give to the program, but also the, the schedule. Okay, test case is basically, okay, you give these inputs, and then first thread one is run, then thread two is run, et cetera, et cetera. 
And by doing this, we can reproduce uh, the, the scheduling uh, scenarios we're looking for. Now, the problem here is that uh, there can be an astronomical number of different uh, scheduling scenarios. So, uh, and many of them uh, can be irrelevant. So, for example, suppose that uh, all of these would actually be reads of a global variable, right? So this is a read, uh, this is a read in another thread, and this is a read in another thread. Then we know for sure that all of these are are what's called so uh, what's called independent. So it's no matter in which order you execute these three three uh, read operations, the state you reach after having executed all of them will be the same, uh, and uh, also kind of firing in them in, in different orders will not give you uh, a, a different global state to reach. Uh, so we can actually uh, use uh, some techniques to actually prune uh, irrelevant interleavings. So interleavings that we know will not produce any behavior we haven't already seen uh, by our testing uh, tool. So uh, we have a large number of in irrelevant interleavings and what we'd love to do is to cut out some of these interleavings, but only cut out, so, so not to test uh, using these thread schedules, but only do that if we can provably show that we're not going to find anything interesting there. So all the things, all the states that are reachable uh, through these two paths have been already explored through this path down by the testing done in, down here, right? So this is, uh, we're not going to do heuristic things. We're going to cut only if we can provably show that there's nothing interesting down there. OK. So there's uh, many existing algorithms uh, that use independence of state transitions. Um, one of the uh, most uh, useful for uh, testing purposes is actually the so-called dynamic uh, partial order reduction of the EPOR algorithm that was uh, produced by Flanagan and Godefroy in 2005. Um, there's another very similar algorithm called race detection and flipping uh, done by Koshik Sen in his uh, PhD thesis uh, together with uh, Gulakha, uh, which is uh, his supervisor. And, um, these are very nice algorithms, and I'll, I'll go to them a bit deeper. Um, if you know um, partial order reductions for model checking, uh, then one way to, uh, to think about DPOR is that it, it will actually compute persistent sets. So it is a version of, of persistent set algorithm that is tailored to, to testing purposes. Um, and uh, let's go get back to that a bit later. Okay, so where does this independence come from? So we have multi-threaded programs and, and I'm claiming there's independence between operations. So there's things we can exploit to test less test cases for multi-threaded programs. Here are some examples. This is not an exclu uh, kind of exhaustive list. So uh, if you have two operations uh, that uh, first of all do local data operations on their local variables, then it doesn't matter in which order you do them. Uh, they do not communicate with each other. They cannot affect uh, each other's outcomes in any way. They do not disable each other, etc. Then if we have um, two reads that are in different processes uh, that, go, that uh, access even the same global variable, they're independent with each other because no matter which order you execute them, uh, you will always end up in the same final state and uh, executing one doesn't disable the other either. Um, then if we have two writes in different processes uh, that are into two different global variables, those are also uh, independent uh, because uh, no matter which order you execute them, you will end up in the same final state and uh, Executing one doesn't disable the other. So let's uh, have a kind of formalization of what these kind of intuitive notions of independence uh, boil down to. 
and um, and what uh, then can be uh, can be done uh, using these kinds of things. So. I should say that uh, usually these independence relations are computed using the source code of the program and uh, things similar to this. So are these operations, read operations, write operations, lock operations, or local data uh, manipulation or local branching? So um, usually these independence relations are just computed on, on just the local structure uh, of, of the state uh, transitions. Okay, so now a bit of theory. So, um, independence induces diamond structures in the state space as follows. So, if we have a, a pair T and U of independent state transitions, uh, let's take the two reads uh, to the uh, same global variable. Uh, then they satisfy the following two properties for all sequences of state transitions of the system. So, if uh, you have some execution of the system, where you first fire T, and then you fire U, and then you fire another sequence, uh, W prime after that. If this is an execution of the system, so you do something, then fire T, then U, and then so do something else, then uh, you can also flip these into another order. So you, independent transitions can be permuted if they are next to each other in, in, a, in a sequence. So you can first fire the U, and then T, and then uh, do the W prime. Right? So that, that should hold for all, all kind of definitions of independence we'll use. Then another in, uh, thing uh, about independent actions is this, what I've been talking about, that independent actions shouldn't disable each other. So if we have an execution W that uh, allows T, T to be executed, and, uh, and the same execution W also allows U to be executed next, so we have a state where both T and U are, are enabled. Then uh, in the state where T has been executed, U is still enabled. And in the state where U has been executed, T is also enabled. So if we have these two things uh, for a pair of transitions, then we can call them independent. And uh, one way to find out such things is by uh, doing a static analysis on the program and figuring out things like that. So, question? Yeah? Uh, on the previous slide, on the first item... Uh, Which one? This one? The, the first condition you showed for diamond property. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so is, it, is the first item not too strong? I mean, I can imagine there are cases where you would like to flip the, the order of the two and obtain some uh, state which is like W prime, but perhaps with some permutation. Mm -hmm. so, so, this just says that uh, W prime is not a state, it's just uh, uh, a sequence of executions. So this should hold for all sequences of executions, W and W prime. So uh, it doesn't have to be, this doesn't say that the states have to be identical, actually. Uh, it just says that, okay, no matter what you execute after that, um, the same thing should be enabled in the other, other path as well. Now, uh, is, is, it, is it not possible to construct a weaker condition which says that if you can do W prime in the first place after doing TU, then you can do some W double prime that is a permutation of W prime? Okay, but then, then <coughs> let's put it this way. Um, there's uh, kind of um, different definitions of independence. Uh, there's things called uh, conditional independence, for example, which says that, okay, Two actions are independent only in particular states, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, for this lecture, <laughs> this is the definition of independence I'm going to use. Otherwise, we're going to head uh, to to uncharted territory, so to speak. <laughs> so, so this is a very simple and very basic definition of independence. And and this is static. It doesn't uh, take a look at the current state of the system. It just says that, OK, for all executions, W and W prime, if this holds, then the two things are independent, T and U. OK, there. Thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I see, see where you're heading. So um, the algorithms I, I talk about um, take a kind of a cautious uh, approach to independence. So if, if, uh, if you can prove that uh, for all, let's say, all variable indexes, uh, T and U are independent, then we say they are independent. But uh, if, if not, if you cannot that prove that statically, then we take the cautious approach and say they are dependent. Let's try out all the schedulings. So, so the more, more precise. So, so this definition of independence is uh, very semantic. And uh, while this one is basically fully static. And, uh, and you can, you can imp improve your static analyses, but, but in all the algorithms I'm going to use, they are going to use very rough static analyses. Let's say linear time or, or, or quadratic time in the, in the things we've seen so far, static analyses, figuring out what could be independent. And if, if that doesn't suffice, then it says, okay, they must be dependent. Okay? Okay, let's move forward. Okay, so, so that's the independence. Um, now, I have to uh, introduce you some theory. So, uh, who of you have seen Mazurkiewicz traces? Couple, but not too many, okay. So, just to, uh, just to have this in your vocabulary. Uh, uh, we'll survive without it, really. Uh, but, but just uh, to have a... Uh, I talk about this, I should, uh, I should mention Mazurkiewicz traces. So let's suppose uh, we have an execution, W prime prime, which is, uh, well, just this sequence, uh, where T and U are independent. Then uh, suppose, um, given as, let's say, T and U are statically uh, uh, so, so let's say, let's say uh, this will basically lead us to the same final state if you permute these into a different order. Um, then if we take the union of all the execution sequences that can be obtained from W prime prime by permuting two independent transitions that are next to each other, we can keep on permuting. If we find another pair that is next to each other, we can swap them. And if we do this, uh, we will get uh, an equivalence class, uh, which is called a Mazurkiewicz trace. So this, uh, we use these uh, brackets in here, square brackets, to denote all the uh, executions that are uh, equivalent in the sense that they will lead to the same final state and they have been obtained from each other by permuting independent actions that are next to each other. So, so you can kind of do one permutation, then you have a new word, then you look for are there any independent actions that are next to each other, you can permute again, and permute again, and permute again. And then um, all the executions in such a Mazurkiewicz trace are actually executable. So all the sequences that you can obtain are executable, and uh, they will all lead to the same final state, right? So if we're, for example, testing and looking for all the te deadlocks of, that the system might have, or if we're looking for uh, all uh, reachable uh, control states the program might have, testing actually only one of them will suffice. So uh, you can pick any one from this Mazurkiewicz trace and leave the, all the other traces in the same, uh, same equivalence class untested, and you will still find the same deadlock. Questions about this one? Nope. Okay. So, um, as a side note, uh, so if a partial order reduction method preserves uh, one test from each Mazurkiewicz trace, then as I said, it will also preserve all the deadlocks of the system. Because uh, in order to uh, reach a different deadlock, you have to actually uh, solve the races you have in your program in a different way. So. One way to think about Mazurkiewicz traces is that each Mazurkiewicz trace 
is a particular way to solve all the races in your program. And, uh, and um, if you just uh, do testing in such a way that you test for each particular way of solving the races you might have in your program, then you will have tested all the possible outcomes, final outcomes uh, of, of that program. Now, this is, uh, this is simplifying things a bit, but it, it is a good intuition. One must keep its trace per one way of solving all your races that you have. Okay. Now, um, this uh, dynamic partial order, yeah. Uh, is this true for all these, uh, uh, say, safety properties, or is it true also for some other kind of properties? So, for example, if the partial order reduction is true, then it will also be true for each uh, same reserve space. Yeah. Right? Also, for those all networks, can we say anything about, say, for another prop other properties like, say, uh, lightness or some branching line properties? Uh, so, so, okay. If we uh, want to go uh, towards model checking, um, then uh, you can go, for example, to the model checking book uh, by uh, Clark, Pered, and Krumberg, and go to the chapter 10 of that book, and then there you will find an approach which uh, preserves all LTL properties that are so-called stuttering insensitive. So all, L, all of LTL without the next time operator properties are, are preserved by that particular technique in, in chapter 10 of that book. And it's, it's a fairly nice write-up of the thing. Um, for branching time properties, uh, you will need uh, additional things. Uh, I can point you to a paper by Antti Valmari that uh, has a kind of a, a list of things you can preserve using uh, this family of methods and, uh, and uh, et cetera. So yeah, I can give you further pointers, but, but so far we are only talking about lift lo preserving deadlocks here. And, uh, and anything you can kind of, you can uh, kind of reduce many problems to deadlock detection. So you can add an observer to the system that deadlocks if and only if a particular sequence of bad states happens, for example. And by using that, you can uh, reduce any safety property to this, right? So it's not as restrictive as you'd like, but not, not infinite. I'm not going to talk about infinite runs because we're not doing model checking. We're doing testing here. OK, other questions? Okay, let's, let's move forward. Um, so, DPOR algorithm uh, by Flanagan and Godefroyd. Um, it uh, calculates uh, additional, uh, what additional interleavings need to be explored based on the history of the current execution. I'll have more intuition about this in a sec. Uh, and once the uh, DPOR algorithm, so it's actually a depth first search algorithm. And once a DPOR algorithm has fully explored a subtree from a state, it will have explored a persistent set of, of states from, from that set state, which says something to people who have heard of persistent sets. So how many of you have heard of persistent sets, ample sets? Anybody? Maybe, okay. So that's to relate to, to this uh, family of techniques. Um, and it will find all deadlock assertions and, uh, on local states. And as said, any persistent set approach preserves one interleaving from each muscle or give its trace. They might have more interleavings, but there's at least one for each uh, uh, muscle or give its trace. OK. So the DPOR algorithm does uh, depth first traversal of the state space. Uh, there's two phases. Um, I'm not going to go through the algorithm in detail. I'm just going to give you a rough overview of what does it do. In the first uh, part of the algorithm, it tries to detect races between state transitions. So um, it runs uh, a testing loop, and, and whenever it finds a new state, it checks at the, all the transitions that are enabled in that state and then checks if there is uh, a transition in the history 
uh, of that test run that is actually in race with the, uh, with the uh, transition that is enabled. So for example, uh, a case where uh, in a test run, uh, we have a global variable x, which is first written by process one, and then when we run that test case further, we find, find that, okay, there's uh, a state where uh, a read by process two is also in, enabled uh, from the same variable. And uh, this could also be uh, concurrent because it's, uh, it's from another thread. And we are not sure whether these two will be actually enabled at the same time. So whenever such a, such a potential race condition is detected, you add a backtracking point. So you say, okay, uh, now just before uh, we fired uh, this write uh, by process one, we should also explore the other uh, way of uh, solving the race uh, where the read by process two happens first. Okay? And by doing this, uh, you first detect the race. You figure out, okay, this, this read uh, is dependent with this write that's higher up in the test case. And then once we have this write higher up in the test case, we say, okay, is the, is the read already enabled there? If yes, then we also try to uh, fire it there. Okay. And now, if it happens to be that uh, this uh, read by process two is actually disabled uh, at the point uh, where the write is enabled, then uh, we have to actually uh, fire all the possible enabled transitions. Uh, and this, is, uh, this can also happen uh, uh, in the algorithm. So I'll, I will not go through the algorithm in detail. I will just say that, okay, it's two-part algorithm. This is the original algorithm. Uh, it's reproduced from one of our, our papers. Um, what it does, it first, uh, it is an exploration algorithm. Uh, it uh, loops through all the processes and figures out, okay, what are the next enabled transitions? And then uh, it loops through uh, the history, uh, trying to look for things that uh, might be uh, kind of concurrently uh, enabled uh, with, uh, with the event that we're just uh, considering this event W. And uh, if it finds such a thing, then if it checks, okay, just before this I that is now potentially in race with, dub with V that we're analyzing right now, if V is enabled just before firing uh, this uh, 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 I that is in race with this, then uh, we also want to fire V at that point. So, so try the other outcome of the race. And then if it happens to be that V is actually disabled there, then what we have is we have to add all enabled transitions in order not to uh, miss anything. So, so you, we might have to actually fire some other, other transitions enabled to enable V uh, just before I, and we have to also go through the, the, the kind of uh, case analysis there. So, so that's the basic idea. You find uh, enable transitions during your testing, you, you look at your history, you try to figure out is there in history something that could be in race with what we have right now. If, if there is, then at the point where that thing later, later on in the history was there, you had a backtracking point and you try the other outcome of the race. And by doing this systematically, uh, you will uh, do, uh, try out all the outcomes of races. And by doing that, you will actually preserve all Mazurkiewicz traces because each outcome of resolving the races is, is a Mazurkiewicz trace. Okay, so, so there's uh, lots of notation. So this is very notation heavy. I'm not uh, expecting you to understand the details of things. Uh, there's things like this. Okay, uh, okay. Is, this, is I uh, potentially concurrently enabled with uh, V that we're looking at right now? And for that, there's, <coughs> there's a part of the pseudocode that actually executes things forward. So you loop, uh, 
you've uh, initialized the backtracking set to fire at least something from each state, and then uh, you go through uh, backtracking set, uh, looking for things you haven't explored yet, and then uh, you remember which things you've explored already, and then what you do here, you do bookkeeping to figure out, okay, which things might be in race with what. So there's some additional bookkeeping to detect the races for the first part. So, uh, so this, this comparison in here doesn't come, uh, come uh, out of blue, uh, blue but the, uh, the things that are needed to, to do that comparison is this, uh, this chunk of code in here to update all the data structures you need for the race detection. And then, uh, then you uh, kind of recursively call this. So um, tricky. But uh, it's been done once. You can find the pseudocode in, uh, in different papers. You can implement that. Happy times. Right? Um, so, um, so to detect races, DPOR uh, tracks the causal relationships of global operators in order to identify backtracking points. Uh, in typical implementation, like the one in the pseudocode in the previous slide, uh, for race detection, you use actually vector clocks. Um, and the optimized, we have an optimized DPOR approach, pseudocode, uh, that only did actually for ACSD uh, 2012. Uh, so you can find all the pseudocode from that paper if, if you want to implement it to your own tool. Um, and I actually have another slide set uh, about this stuff. So, so hold on, I'll, I'll switch slides. Um, so, okay, right. So, this is from, uh, this has some more examples. So, testing multi threaded programs with DPOR. Um, uh, we're using uh, both uh, DSE and partial order reduction. And, uh, and the paper, ACSD paper, had a couple of contributions. Uh, so we improved the dynamic partial order reduction a bit. Uh, I'll come back to that. And then uh, we showed how to combine this with dynamic symbolic execution methods. And then also had some experiments. Uh, so we already talked about how we have to uh, be able to control scheduling. Um, and scheduling. Uh, can be done at the level of visible operations, as said, reads of global variables, writes of global variables, locks, unlocks. These are the things we capture, and these are the time points where we, uh, we uh, actually control the threats. Okay, who gets to go next? And uh, we explore the execution tree by repeatedly exploring alternative interleavings. So here's an example that I wanted to show you. So um, let's suppose we have, uh, have such, an, uh, such an, uh, an example. So in, the, um, in here we have one global variable A. Uh, then we have thread one, with, which basically uh, uh, first uh, assigns to a local variable the contents of A, then uh, assigns two to the, uh, to the global variable A, then another concurrent thread uh, that's also initially uh, trying to, uh, to its local temporary variable assign the value of the global variable A. And now we can of course try out all the different interleavings. So suppose we, uh, we run thread one first, do this first line of assignment first, uh, then we run thread two, uh, do this assignment second, and then run thread one once more time, we get here. So this is an interleaving, so first thread one, then thread two, then thread one. Another interleaving would be uh, in here, for example, uh, you first uh, run thread one, then you run the thread one again, uh, and then thread two, so that's a, a second interleaving. And then a third interleaving in here is one where you first run the thread two and then run the two thread one uh, uh, 
executions again. Right. Now the final state in here, uh, in this in this example is m is one, t is uh, one, and a is two. Uh, in here it's m is one, t is two, and a is two. And in here is m is one, t is one, and a is two, which is exactly the same thing as we saw in this last thing. So so there might be some some redundancy here because. The state you reach in this branch is actually the same as the state you reach in this branch, right? Um, okay. So um, in uh, in this algorithm, uh, we uh, consider the case of finding deadlocks, uh, and for some visible operations, for example, for two reads um, that uh, read the same global variable, the order in which they are executed doesn't matter. Um, and partial order reduction methods are exploiting these independencies. And now, if you go to the original uh, DPOR algorithm uh, that I showed you the pseudocode of, um, it uh, basically uh, identifies these backtracking points uh, that uh, are alternative ways to uh, basically uh, resolve um, conflicts. And the backtracking points are explored until no unexplored ones remain. So that's the basic idea. OK, and now uh, back to, uh, to this algorithm. OK, let me take a sip. So, um, so the DPOR tracks these causal relationships of visible operations. Uh, and our implementation uses vector clocks. And we'll have um, uh, vector clocks that um, track also the last accesses to communication objects. And a backtracking point is added when a threat's next operation uses a previously accessed uh, communication object and the two visible operations are concurrent. Now, um, if you take a look at the original pseudocode uh, of the DPOR algorithm I showed you, actually that algorithm will uh, uh, not uh, obtain any reduction in this uh, example. Why is that? Well, because it uh, uses vector clocks in such a way that it actually assumes that two reads to the same global variable are dependent. So it says that, okay, two operations are dependent if they access the same variable, right? Now, um, using this more refined notion of vector clocks, you can actually say that, okay, two reads are independent. And um, this is sketched in the original DPOR algorithm paper, but it's not, uh, the pseudocode is not there, so it's there in, in all this uh, paper. So, um, so in the original, uh, in the previous example, the original DPOR would not have achieved any reduction. So, so let's see if we, if I, Manage to uh, figure out how this goes. So if you go down this route, the DPOR in here will notice that, okay, this operation and that operation are both accessing the global variable A. So therefore, uh, just before this guy, um, we should also try to fire this event if it's enabled. So it will add this to the backtracking point. Uh, then when going up here, uh, uh, let's see now. Well, already in here, when going down here, already in here, okay, let me, let me do this systematically, then, then, we're, then we're doing better. Okay, so we start from here. In the initial state, there's nothing much to be done. Then when we go, uh, go to this state, we notice that there's these two things that are enabled. Then the original DPOR detects that this guy is actually dependent on this one. So this one should be also tried in here, just before this one, to figure out the different race outcome of, of uh, these operations. And the original DPOR will say that, OK, these two reads are actually dependent because they access the same global variable. Now, all this version will actually not do this, but will actually notice that, OK, uh, this read and that read are actually not dependent. So it will not add a backtracking point there. Uh, then if we go further down, once we see this guy and that guy, we will not add more backtracking points. Then we go, when we go down here, 
Then when we see this one, we find that that one is dependent with that one. And just before that one, we have to try out the other outcome of this race between these two. So we add this backtracking point there. So uh, what uh, will happen is, uh, is uh, in, in, in here, uh, in, in all this version, actually, uh, this will be the final outcome. And in the original uh, DPOR, there will be also branches down here and, and down here. OK, so by using a better vector clock, you can uh, track that, OK, actually reads are concurrent or, or independent. And, and that in effect reduces the state space, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we'll have two test cases instead of three yeah. for here. Yeah, yeah. So, so this will be here. There will be one state here that's that's missing in the in the figure. Sorry, but uh, but this part will be cut because uh, that thing is now now not dependent on that one. So we don't have to add this backtrack point at any stage with a more refined uh, notion of independence. Okay. Um, so I hope you got the, I don't, I think you will not get the details, but you'll get the flavor. Okay, so you go down, you look for races higher up. When you find a potential race, you try the other outcome just before the race point, right? And, and, and see the papers for the exact algorithms. Okay, questions? Right? So, um, now, um, this was uh, for, uh, for just uh, interleaving. So, so what if we add data? Well, it's actually pretty easy to add data here. So suppose uh, we, have, um, we have now just uh, uh, kind of uh, sequential code. And uh, we, can, we can, of course, generate the, the uh, test cases. Now, if we add, um, add another thread that's concurrent, then uh, we'll have such execution trees where the blue nodes are scheduling decisions. In here, you either run thread one this way or you run thread two this way. So the blue things are scheduling decisions. The red points are actually data dependent decisions. So once you decide to run thread one forward, you have to decide whether this input B, uh, was it a value that goes uh, to the if branch or, or was it a value that goes to the else branch, right? And now you can put both of these in the same tree. So you do, you do a scheduling decision after which you run that thread forward and do the local uh, control flow decisions until you hit uh, a visible action that is either a read of a global variable, write of a global variable, or access of a clock, lock. And once you have that, then you do that. And uh, then you are ending up with the scheduling, uh, scheduling decision once more. And sometimes these scheduling decisions might be easy, like in here. Well, thread one has already terminated at that point. So the only thing to move forward is, is to run the thread two until the end. OK, so just. There's no magic. You can put scheduling decisions and data-dependent decisions into the same testing tree. And then you'll have uh, different branches there. And um, we have a tool called LCT uh, that uh, uses a client-server model to distribute work to multiple computers over a network. Um, it's open source. We've also implemented sleep sets. And um, the, uh, the details on how this works are, are in the paper. Um, let me show some experiments. And I think then it would be a good time to, uh, to have a break. I'm or a myself. We can go until 3.30. 3.30, OK. OK, then, uh, then let's go forward, uh, if, if that's fine. So um, 
Okay, so let's go forward. So uh, we evaluated this uh, modified DPOR uh, against the unmodified one that actually thinks that reads are dependent. Um, and then uh, against uh, JQ uh, algorithm uh, race detection and flipping. And uh, one of the things is that uh, actually, as I'll uh, have a slide about later on, the redemption achieved by DPOR actually depends on the first random schedules. So the way you uh, flip the coins in the first run actually makes, the, uh, makes you get the different set of test cases, um, which is uh, not obvious. And because of that, uh, we uh, report averages of several independent uh, measurements. And, uh, and uh, in our modified DPOR, we also had a sleep set effect in there. Yeah. Nope. Nope. It, it, it sounds a little bit like for the BDD stuff, where you choose the variables in the same Yeah, there can be very big differences in different orders, actually, yeah. So, but uh, there's no... Kari, was there a paper on, uh, on heuristic orderings of DPOR? Do you... Do you... Yeah, there's one paper which I haven't read, unfortunately, but God, it probably has. So. <laughs> okay. So you can, some people have played around with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but we haven't. So, so this is just random, random orders. Um, so these are pretty simple programs. Um, one of the, uh, the things we see in here is that, okay, if you add this independence of reads to many of the programs, well, the number of test cases actually drops pretty significantly. Uh, if you add sleep sets on top of that, that I'll have a few words in, in the future, it drops even more. And then actually this um, uh, race detection and flipping algorithm implementation used to be pretty good. Uh, Later on, we discovered that this uh, actually is buggy. So, so uh, the JQ was, we found examples where JQ doesn't actually preserve all or give its traces. So we're taking this with a bit of grain of salt these days. Um, uh, so, um, but uh, we're, without all these tricks, there's no way to uh, even come close to JQ. Uh, but I don't know how many things it's losing because of the box in there. Um, okay, so just saying that, okay, uh, if you wanna test multi-threaded programs, yeah, it, it does make a huge difference if you add, add these partial order reduction algorithms. And, and then without these, I don't think any one of these would, would terminate then. So, so you would just generate more and more test cases all over again. But these are, as I said, stateless, so so once you blow the execution tree a bit on first level, you blow it a bit on second level, it's a, there are these multiplies over, over the tree. So, so it pays to be very careful, uh, at least uh, in the beginning, because that, that can multiply over time. Okay, so um, we had a modified DPOR with commutativity. We've actually implemented this in LCT, and, uh, and it gets competitive amounts of reduction. So questions about, oh, nice reminder. Uh, okay, uh, questions about this at this stage? Yeah. Okay, I'll switch slide sets then, then I can't. I have a question yeah, about yeah. that. Uh, 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 you probably applied it to We're, we're, we're still kind of in the let's try all the academic benchmarks out yeah, there yeah, yeah. kind of mode. Uh, but yeah, we'd love to uh, try this out in, in, in a more, let's say, real world setup. Uh, yeah, yeah. But on the academic benchmarks? Is it, is it? It's, uh, I'd, I'd say uh, JQ is, uh, is, uh, is a state of the art in here, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and we're getting there. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. But does it also mean that if you're supposed to take your numbers extra, that you can balance over your own need 
Um, now for that, I don't remember. Kari, have we done the analysis and only? What is the minimal number of test cases? I don't think we have done any analysis on this. Nope. Okay. I don't know. We don't know. Sorry, yep. So the algorithm, the, the right of the algorithm that simultaneous testing, right? Uh, is there any comparison uh, with the how, how much does that influence testing at all? Maybe it makes so, sense if the, the difference is not so big, if you use a simpler algorithm to cut Yeah. Yeah, so I think these are very, very similar in, in runtime. And uh, DPLR can be made very fast. Um, all this uh, more, uh, let's say, refined method will, uh, will sometimes be slower. Um, but uh, sometimes it will uh, have exponential savings in the number of test cases. So, so there are some, yeah, you can generate pathological cases where using the simpler algorithm is actually faster, but that doesn't usually happen. Yeah? If, if I understand correctly, the only difference between your algorithm and the previous one yeah. is that you change the independent relation to consider rates. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the main yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, that's the main thing. Is there any hope in keep changing the dependent relation for, or could be interesting to, 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 to try to, to think or to come up with other Transition that it may be the to consider independent. Yeah, sure. Um, I think um, if you can get, come up with a finer notion of independence, you, you can get uh, better reductions. That that's for sure. And uh, and in here, it might actually pay off uh, uh, more than in the model checking context, where things do not multiply over. Uh, that much as, as in here. They do multiply, but not as badly as in here. OK? OK, then let's move forward. Um, but uh, yeah, OK. So open recent file. There we go. Oh, no, no that was the same file. DSC, all right. Mm. OK, so back. So we, we just took a look, look at this slide set. So, so let's move forward. So here's, uh, here's what our, uh, our tool architecture looks like. And um, so we take Java code. Uh, we uh, generate uh, bytecode. And from this, uh, we use a tool, tool called Chimple to, uh, to actually add our instrumentation into the bytecode. And then this is uh, translated back to bytecode. So in the end, we'll have bytecode that uh, contains our instrumentation, which basically tracks every line of the program as, as we go. And also uh, um, kind of adds code before each global variable access and local uh, global uh, lock access to capture those. Uh, then what we have is uh, we actually have a uh, kind of centralized test selector uh, that uh, keeps uh, track of, okay, what paths of the program have already been tested. And then uh, we have test executors. So, so each one of these test executors can be run on a different computer, if you, if you like. And um, the constraint solvers, the SMT solvers we use are on these test executor end. So, so the SMT solvers are actually run in parallel. Uh, so the only thing that's centralized is, is the centralized test selector saying, OK, you go for this path, you go for that path, et cetera. And we had some, uh, we had in the, in the paper uh, um, actually done also uh, this uh, um, DSE DPOR uh, in this setup where we have uh, kind of parallelize the testing. So, so the partial order reduction is done in such a way that each branch of the partial order reduction is done on a different computer. And, um, and the experiments show actually pretty nice speed up. So, so um, if we uh, run uh, 
let's say, up to 20 uh, test executors in parallel, we get speed ups of around uh, 15 times uh, in, in testing of the program. So this is uh, because of the state explosion and because of the number of paths we have, there's actually lots of work to do. And because of that, it parallelizes nicely. So, so one of the good things is, uh, is this works, uh, works actually nicely in parallel setup also. And um, sometimes uh, you have, uh, for example, for uh, parallel model checking, you have uh, scenarios where if you put on the partial order reductions, your speed ups go down. But in here, actually, even with the partial order reductions on, uh, we get nice speed ups. Okay, so that's just a quick thing. So this is uh, this is a setup uh, we have um, parallelized testing also in this in this tool. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about the instrumentation, you yeah. said that uh, the uh, the global variable has to be instrumented especially. Yeah. So this means that the global variable, like what is uh, visible from all address, must be detected uh, before the run, not uh, during the run, like on the on the dynamic basis. Yeah, so, so, um, so basically this code that we add here at the bytecode level is for that. So each time there is an access to a global variable, we actually have. Yeah, but how do you know which variables are actually global? Uh, so yeah, we have uh, knowledge of that, yes. So this knowledge is given from the programmer of the code? Or yeah, so Kari, how does the uh, thing work now? Details. How do we uh, annotate global variables? I think in LCD, it's like simplified that every like field in objects are considered. Okay. So it is external knowledge which is which of these are global. Yeah, well, well, you can like currently it's an over approximation like uh -huh. every, yeah, every field in every class is considered. They can potentially be. Okay. Okay. It's it. Okay. Okay. So so the answer is that uh, we have a a uh, kind of sound uh, over approximation of what what can be global variables. Okay. Good. Uh, other questions? No. Okay. Let's go forward. Um, so um, then we have. Uh, sleep sets that I already mentioned in the previous slide. And um, they were introduced by Patrice uh, Godefroy in uh, basically his, uh, his paper from 1990. And um, I want to mention them because they are a, a very easy to implement technique. Uh, so uh, if you don't have the energy to implement DPOR, you should at least implement sleep sets. Uh, and, uh, and if you uh, implement uh, DPOR, then you should definitely implement sleep sets as well, because they are just easy addition uh, over the much more complicated thing that you've already done uh, so far. So um, sleep sets uh, provide a nice additional reduction on top of DPOR. And uh, there's a, a reprint of uh, Patrice's uh, PhD thesis available in, in this. LNCS volume uh, that I took, uh, took the pseudocode out of. So once more, I'm not going to explain all the details. I'm just trying to get you some idea of, of how things, things are going on. So, uh, so this is a depth first search algorithm. This is from Godefroy's uh, thesis. Um, it's basically. Uh, this is for stateful search, so this is a model checking version of the algorithm. You can also use it for, for testing. Uh, in here you pop a state that you want to explore. Then you add that state into your hash table, uh, like in model checking you do. And then you fire all the transitions that are not in so-called sleep set. And the sleep set will be uh, modified here later. Uh, and now, because DPOR uh, also computes persistent sets, you can use this nicely in combination with DPOR. Uh, the, the proof that this works for persistent sets 
already says that this works for t DPOR. Okay, then uh, we have this branch that we'll ignore because we're not doing model checking. Uh, we're never gonna reach this branch because we'll also only see new states. We will not track the states. But if you do model checking, you have to take a look at that branch as well. Uh, and then uh, we have the main core of the algorithm, which does the following. So uh, for all, all transitions that are, are basically enabled, you compute the state uh, that is reachable after firing that transition. And then you compute the sleep set of, of the successor state uh, to be uh, those transitions in your current sleep set such that uh, the transition that takes you uh, from, uh, from here uh, till there uh, are basically uh, independent uh, in, in the current state. So, so okay. Um, so, so you remove all the, th uh, so basically you remove all the things in, in your current sleep set that are dependent on the transition you take uh, when you go to the successor state. Then you push that st state into the stack, and once you backtrack, you add, uh, add this state, this transition T into your sleep set. So the sleep set basically uh, recovers, kind of remembers all the things that you've explored already from the current state S that are independent uh, of the things uh, you find uh, in, uh, in, in the, in the uh, kind of, that are independent of the, of the transition you, you take into this uh, uh, state S prime. So, so, Okay, so what I should say here is, okay, notice what you need to do. You have to compute independence relations in here. So is this thing independent uh, currently? And that's it. There's no tricky vector clocks or anything. The only thing you need is a way to compute independence. Okay, I'm not going to show why, why this works. Uh, I'm just going to show you an example. So this is one, one example program. And, uh, and this is a kind of execution tree of this, this system. So you go, go, and if you explore the system in this order, so you first go to state two, then you state three, in which you do a, do a read, uh, and then uh, do a global a local branching on thread two on that thread value. Then once you uh, backtrack from this state, uh, you add uh, this uh, thread two into your sleep set. And, uh, and once you backtrack from here, you add this T1 to your sleep set. And then when you go here, then this thing is uh, independent of this T1 and you'll have T1 already in your sleep set. And actually in here, down here, you will notice that uh, you need to not fire any transitions because you've already covered the other case. Uh, you, you basically covered all, all of the behavior uh, already in this branch that you would find down here. So these two states are basically the same as these two states. And, and it, this sleep sets uh, does that. So uh, this was a very hand wavy way of saying that, okay, it's a simple algorithm and, and it uh, cuts many branches, okay? Um, now back to this uh, search order stuff. So I said um, this um, DPOR is, uh, is search order dependent. So if you have, for example, this program where you have global variables x and y and you have a thread one uh, which first does, uh, does a read of x and then an assignment of y and a thread two that first does a read of x and a, and a um, assignment of, of y. So these both are doing first a read and then a write. If you uh, just uh, do the reads first and then do the writes, this is what you'll have. You'll have um, 
we kind of you have to try out both the the uh, interleavings of the writes because they end up in different final state. One where where uh, y ends up being one in the end, and another one where y ends up two in the end. These are different deadlocks, so you have to preserve all both of them, right? But now, if you would uh, execute uh, first read of uh, process one, then write of process. Uh, one, and then read of process two, and then write of process two. This is the first branch. Then uh, you would also have to do this, and you would also have to do this. And suddenly you actually have, uh, have um, basically uh, three, three uh, test cases, out of which uh, this one will have uh, basically write two happening late, so this will have y equals two in here, as will this one. So these two guys are actually, uh, actually the same final state, and these are basically the same, uh, same uh, Mazurkiewicz trace, but uh, because you did the, uh, the exploration in this particular order, you didn't notice that, right? So um, this might uh, blow up uh, pretty badly if you add more and more threads in here. Um, you'll have uh, more and more things. So, so it's search order dependent. Um, another example is in here. Um, here's uh, familiar programs with uh, Exponential uh, DPO are reduced execution trees. Well, the, the idea is simple. So uh, we know that DPO are preserves all deadlocks. Okay? So let's just write the program with an exponential number of deadlocks, right? If we have an exponential number of deadlocks, then we'll have an exponential number of test cases as well. So here's a program with an exponential number of different deadlocks. So how does it go? Well, um, we use uh, n variables, so in here we have two variables, x and y, and for each variable we have two threads, one where x is uh, read and another one where x is written, and for the second variable we have uh, one thread where y is read and another thread where y is written, right? Now for this program there will be uh, uh, an exponential number of, uh, of different uh, outcomes. Actually, the DPOR will try out all the possible ways of, of doing the two different races. So, so clearly, there's a race between thread one and thread two on variable x. So that race has to be decided either to favor thread one going first or thread two going first. And now for, uh, for the variable y, there's a thread, there's a race on, uh, on variable y and it has to be solved by either uh, thread three going first or thread four going first. And when we uh, solve all of these combinations of races, we'll have four ways to uh, resolve races in this program. So this is, uh, this is the uh, DPOR uh, reduced state space of that. Okay, let me take a sip. And uh, this is a kind of an optimal setting, so you cannot get smaller than this. Uh, so, in here we first uh, solve the race between uh, thread one, uh, sorry, uh, the variable x being read or variable x being written. After that, uh, we do the other thing. Uh, okay, and then um, after that we solve the race between variable y being read uh, first and then written or being written first and then read. And now um, we might even get, uh, get more unlucky and get a bigger, bigger DPOR reduced state space, but this is the smallest we can get, right? So we'll have always exponential number of test cases for this program. But there's kind of, um, intuitively there's kind of only two ways, two different ways this program works. One where where the writes go first, uh, sorry, one where the writes go first and one where the uh, reads go first. So we might say, okay, we, we are able to cover the um, 
control states of this program by two test cases. Right? If we want to prove that these are the control states that are reachable, we can generate one test case that goes, OK, let's do all the reads first, and then the writes, and another one where we do first all the writes first, and then all the reads. And we're actually able to prove that that's all there is if we're only interested in control state reachability instead of uh, enumerating all deadlocks we have in our system. So, um, okay. Um, is there a solution? Can we do that? Can we get to, down to two test cases for that example? Uh, the answer is yes, we can. Uh, there's a theory uh, called the theory of unfoldings. And uh, we've had a couple of papers now uh, on how to do, use unfoldings for testing. Um, we're getting into the territory of more expensive algorithms now. So uh, we're going to spend, uh, instead of spending linear time, we're actually going to have backtracking search algorithms inside the testing being run at each test uh, cycle. It's time we add a, add a new thing into our test case. We're going to do a backtrack search algorithm. So these might slow things down. We've carefully engineered them so that they actually run for our benchmarks. Uh, but, uh, but we're getting to the territory where we're using more and more expensive algorithms to try to fight, uh, fight the uh, explosion of test cases. Uh, the unfoldings were usually uh, were originally created by Ken Macmillan. So, so if you know Ken, uh, he has a nice PhD thesis that uh, um, kind of uh, proposes BDD-based model checking, symbolic model checking, and there's a side chapter there that actually uh, uh, proposes this method. So uh, the guy has a very expressive PhD thesis, more more results than anybody I can think of. Um, we did a book together with, uh, with my supervisor, Javier Esparza, when I was a postdoc. Uh, uh, we wrote a book on unfoldings. And this is a book uh, on, uh, on model checking, basically. Um, you can find it online there. We did a deal with Springer that, that we can put the book online. Uh, you can buy a paper copy if you like, but, but just download the PDF and you're set. Okay. Um, so then I thought, OK, let's see uh, what can we do with these if we add them to the testing world. So, so what happens? So what are these things? So if we unwind a control flow graph uh, of a program, uh, we get an execution tree. Now, how many of you have seen Petrinets? So hands up. So most people. OK, so if we have a Petri net, and we'll actually use Petri nets to model the uh, um, control flow of Java programs plus the data flow uh, between threads of Java programs, we'll use that as an abstraction of the control flow and data flow of, of Java programs. Uh, the unwinding of a Petri net is, is called an unfolding. I'll come back to this. And they can be exponentially more compact than execution trees. And uh, because of this, we can actually sometimes get exponentially smaller test suites using this technique than uh, using DPOR. OK, so what is this thing? So, so let's suppose that this is a two-threaded program. So let's say this is trying to grab a lock. It is uh, initially in this program control location. And it's trying to grab a lock that it never releases, it terminates without ever releasing the lock. And then we have another thread running in parallel in here that tries to grab the lock, uh, does some internal stuff, and then releases the lock, and then terminates. So, so what is the uh, unfolding of this? Well, the unfolding is just uh, done by trying out uh, different scenarios that can happen. So for example, in the initial state, we know that, oh, there's a race condition. Either this guy grabs the lock or that guy grabs the lock. OK, so let's systematically try out these race conditions. So if we uh, go to the right, so the right thread 2 actually manages to, to grab the lock. We get in here. And uh, we get into a situation where, actually, 
uh, either uh, we look for the other test case where actually the race was done this way and this guy grabbed the lock first, or we do this other uh, test case where we now release the lock and then move forward. So let's see what happens. So actually in here, we release the lock. And now uh, in the unfolding, instead of putting this token back into this original place, we actually make a new copy of it. Um, so this is like uh, if you do uh, computation trees uh, out of graphs, you do not uh, put the arc back to the state itself, but you do make a new copy of the state, right? So this is the same, but for Petrion. So uh, when we release the lock, we say, okay, now this is the lock after it's been grabbed once by thread two and then released by thread two, right? So this remembers the history of the lock so far. Now we have two scenarios after that. Uh, the one where uh, we either in the initial state uh, grab the lock by thread one, or where we, after thread two has been done with grabbing and releasing the lock, we try this out and, and, and grab the lock at that point. So, and we can go through this. So, so unfolding is basically an acyclic version of the Petrinet, where each time we fire a transition, instead of putting the arcs back to the original places, we make a new copy, right? And uh, if our, uh, Let's say if our programs uh, are, are finite, uh, then the unfolding will also be finite. If all our program executions are finite, then our unfolding will also be finite. And I'll be talking about this case in the follow-up. So I will not talk about uh, what, what to do when we have uh, loops. Uh, so we'll truncate loops at, forcefully at, let's say, at some number of iterations if needed uh, in, in the follow-up. And uh, maybe now is a good time to have a break. Yeah. Questions at this point? Okay. Okay, thank you. I have a slightly dark uh, 